Good morning, everyone. This is Amy Robertson. I'm the science coordinator for the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. I'd like to welcome, welcome you today to our webinar on scenario planning, uh, climate change scenario planning for adaptation. And uh, we have Greg Garfin and Holly Hartman from the University of Arizona will be our experts today during the presentation. So I'm going to introduce Greg. He's the assistant professor and assistant extension specialist in climate science, policy, and natural resources at the School of Natural Resources and the Environment, and also the Deputy Director for Science Translation and Outreach at the Institute of the Environment, both at the University of Arizona. And uh, Greg, I would welcome you to add anything you'd like to that, and please introduce Holly for us. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Um, this is, uh, thanks, it's a real uh, pleasure to uh, be part of this webinar and to look down the participant list and see a kind of who's who of um, really excellent folks in the uh, federal government and a few others from outside. Um, so uh, just briefly, um, I think the motivation for this was that um, Amy and colleagues and collaborators with the uh, Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative um, are interested in uh, tackling issues related to uh, climate change and high uncertainty in the future. And um, Holly Hartman uh, has been an excellent uh, colleague of mine for the last 13 years. She's a, a hydrologist, um, or is trained in hydrology, has done many things and has uh, collaborated with uh, many uh, federal government agencies over the years. And if I'm correct about this, Holly, you've been working on scenario planning since uh, 2006, and that includes um, a lot of work with the National Park Service, the BLM, and um, other entities. Uh, so Holly has a, a wealth of experience and um, some wisdom to share with us. So take it away, Holly. Yeah. Hi, Greg. Thanks. And uh, thanks to all of you for inviting me to talk about scenario planning. I'm really uh, enthused about your enthusiasm in uh, talking about scenario planning and considering it, whether it's applicable to the problems and issues that you face. Um, I've been involved with scenario planning uh, really since about, say, 2003, 2004, through the uh, National Science Foundation Science and Technology Center uh, called SARA, for the sustainability of semi-arid hydrology and riparian areas, which was based here at the University of Arizona. And we were trying to figure out how to make experimental, uh, complex research models useful for decision makers when they're not really ready for prime time in terms of uh, real decision making. And that models were just really complex in how do you make uncertain information um, meaningful. And scenario planning turned out to be a, a useful approach. As Greg said, I got involved in working with the National Park Service uh, a little later, 2007, about uh, Lee Welling from the National Park Service asked me to think about scenario planning with some of the um, issues they were facing. The slide you're looking at now is an example from a, the very first experiment in scenario planning that Lee Welling started with the National Park Service. This is for Joshua Tree National Park, where you can see up in the upper left-hand corner the iconic Joshua trees that are there now. And in going through a scenario planning process, <coughs> the, the work team was able to identify three very different possible futures that were plausible, not just probable, but plausible for the Joshua Tree region. You can see up in the upper right-hand corner a transition to something more like the Sonoran Desert rather than the Mojave Desert. You can see in the lower left-hand or the lower left-hand corner there a transition to um, more of annual grasses and having a, a, a fire regime that had a sort of high-frequency uh, return interval of fires. And then in the lower right a transition to more of a dune system, what you might consider a classic desert system. Those three futures, just looking at those pictures, are very different, and it would be um, implausible to think that everything else facing Joshua Tree National Park would be held constant if the climate was invoking these kinds of changes on the landscape. 
the one future that was not plausible, looking out to mid-century and beyond to the end of century, is the one in the upper left-hand corner that is the current landscape of Joshua Tree National Park. So I'm going to be going through sort of the process of scenario planning, some of the issues, some of the approaches. Um, this approach to the National Park Service has found it very successful. It's been amazing to me how quickly the Park Service has taken up uh, scenario planning and used it in a number of applications and developed a whole series of experiments to test um, its usefulness and build it out. Other agencies have gotten involved, in particular Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Bureau of Land Management, and so on. So I'll be talking about a few of those case examples as we go forward. So it, you know, this, this whole interest in scenario planning is really driven by climate, but there are a lot of things other than climate that are experiencing what we consider this, uh, this concept of VUCA, that is increasing volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And you can see from this slide how you might encounter increased volatility. That is, if you have a distribution, for example, of temperatures and you have a shift in that distribution where the average or, or median value is, increases a little bit, it means that these, what were once rare events now are more common, and in some cases very much more common, and so the system looks a lot more volatile, a lot more variable in seeing some extreme events or unusual events. We all understand that information, <laughs> we have a lot of information, but we've got increasing uncertainty, especially when it comes to climate, based on the uncertainty related to emissions, especially after mid-century. Our systems are complex. It's not just about climate and its physical impacts but how it affects ecosystems and how that enters into the social system, the policy system, and so on. And then this last notion of ambiguity, where we don't have in uncertainty. It's not just uncertainty about information, but that the meaning of that information, a legitimate interpretation of that information may be ambiguous and not yet clear. So how do we deal with <laughs> volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And this is where scenario planning comes in. We can think of sort of how, in your work, what's vulnerable to this notion of VUCA and what might you do about it. Well, there's a lot of different decision strategies that people take when it comes to um, dealing with volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. One is just to ignore that it happens. We don't want to be the guy here with his head in the sand. That's sort of the equivalent. You can do things like punt, just have a decision, go with it and say we're going to commit to that future. Another approach is just to delay and assess, and this is what I consider something like an adaptation bottleneck. We just wait, wait for more information, do more analysis, wait, wait, wait. Another approach is to make a commitment but have some fallbacks, that is have a few contingency plans, a few options. Um, another approach is to shape the future. Traditionally, a lot of planning is saying, let's look closely at the things that we have control over. Uh, and and then try to shape our future. The best way to predict the future is to create it. Right? But with climate and some of these other driving forces or external forces of change, our ability to shape the future uh, isn't so great. So then we're looking at options, like looking for uh, robust options, looking for options or decision strategies that are good across a lot of different possible conditions. And then maybe the most advanced and where scenario planning really allows us to go is to create then this portfolio of options that shifts over time, similar to what you might see in an investment portfolio, where as your conditions change, as your expectations and uh, values or um, as those change, that you shift how much investment you put in different kinds of resources to accommodate your current needs and future uncertainty. Right. So let's take a little closer look at uh, scenario planning. Scenario planning is the whole goal is to foster strategic thinking. It's to challenge our thinking about the future. There's nothing uh, really special about scenario planning in, in the scenarios that are created by scenario planning other than they're a tool. They're stories or narratives about ways that conditions might play out. The one requirement is that they be internally consistent and plausible. They're not forecasts. They're not predictions. They're not a method for trying to decide on the most likely future. You can see here from this scenario funnel over in the bottom left-hand corner, we're going from conditions of today and saying the plausible future is out in some uh, future time. 
may be uh, widely variable, may be quite different from each other. The whole notion in connecting that with decisions is that you're looking at systems that have high uncertainty and you, there's a lot of things that are outside your control. I'd like to contrast it a little bit with something um, I'm sure you all are um, experienced with, and that's adaptive management. The difference between the two, it's not a, sort of a bright line or a hard line, but adaptive management assumes that you've got some ability to control your uh, system and what drives your system so that you can run experiments about different management options, look at their uh, success, and then transition that to other locations. With the baseline of climate changing over the coming decades, your conditions, your ability to control your adaptive management experiments drops so that scenario planning becomes, um, in some cases, the most appropriate approach for looking at your system and trying to manage your system. I want to also point out that scenario planning is a creative process. And through a series of activities, if you organize it as a structured process, it, you can think of it as systematic creativity. You can kind of see here where scenarios fit in terms of um, looking at how much uncertainty you're looking at and the complexity of the system that you're working with. We're moving beyond forecasts and predictions. We're moving beyond climate projections. Uh, we're ranging into the area of exploring what if. We aren't necessarily going into full-on speculation like science fiction, but you're somewhere between the climate projections or other kinds of land use or economic projections and so on, and explorations of what could be. So, and in thinking specifically about climate, this is this is a nice slide for kind of showing where scenario planning focuses. Uh, we can look at climate issues and think about how we might adapt to uh, changing and variable climates respond to what we think we know is happening or what is likely to happen. But scenario planning's key contribution is in focusing on these bottom two areas about what could happen, where you're looking at shifts in the envelope of climate distributions, or what is unlikely but possible, looking at climate regimes that haven't yet been seen or um, that we, our understanding of what could be is evolving over time. I want to contrast this real quickly with a couple of different approaches for dealing with scenarios that we commonly encounter and that often are called scenario planning. One is a series of models, sort of the chain of models as you go from the global climate model outputs to uh, downscaled regional climate model outputs to input, say, into terrestrial ecosystem models, terrestrial hydrology models, and so on, and then management models. These approaches are really trying to characterize uncertainty. They're very useful for identifying what we think we know with to be highly likely and then what things we think we know uh, with very low certainty uh, or high uncertainty. So these kinds of studies are, are, are useful for the kind of scenario planning that we're going to be talking about. The other approach is over here on the, on the right-hand side, and some of you may have been involved in these kind of processes already, and that is things like transportation planning, uh, community planning, downtown redevelopment planning, and so on, where the key uncertainty is social uncertainty about the acceptability of different possibilities. And the goal is to come up with a shared vision and shared goals. Often they don't consider climate change to, um, in quite the same way that, that we're, we're going to consider here. So I'm going to be talking specifically about this middle approach, which is focused on embracing the uncertainty. Say, let's take a look at those things that really are uncertain and go with it, see what their implications might be and what we might do in response to the different um, scenarios. So the, in thinking about your planning, this is probably a, um, a traditional kind of approach is what are you doing with your typical planning, you're, you, you're defining your goals, you're taking stock of where you are, you're examining trends, you set your targets and thresholds about where you want to be at some time in the future and direct your management toward that. Going through the NEPA process, you may look at several different outcomes or al uh, alternatives and you go through a process to choose one. The challenge is, is that you know, this, this represents something that uh, this, this kind of uh, framework for the crown of the continent system in the northern Rockies. The challenge is that you've got a lot of external forces of control that impinge on your system and can knock you off track in trying to achieve your goals or your vision. And that can range from climate to unexpected development pressures, uh, economic changes, the uh, different policies that come along, 
invasive species, and a whole host of others that I think that you probably all have uh, experience with or have heard about affecting different public lands in the past. All right, so let's quickly go through some of the different phases in scenario planning. It's nice to think about three phases, the, just preparing for the process, then building and refining the scenarios, and then using them. There's nothing really special about preparing for the process beyond a couple of things I'll mention. There's a lot in common with other processes, whether it's something like strategic decision making or uh, looking at adaptation conservation targets and so on. I like to use this figure from the National Park Service that shows where scenario development fits within a larger adaptation planning framework. You can see here in the yellow box in the middle where scenario development and exploring plausible future scenarios fits in. At any point of this, this whole framework, um, there's a lot of process about preparing for anyone, doing any one of these activities, especially um, if you're involving multiple organizations uh, or, or the public. Right. Some of the challenges um, that, that I think are unique to groups that are dealing with public resources and public resource management is that institutionally we need a documentable, replicable process so um, that's one reason for developing sort of standardized approaches that you see from, say, the National Park Service, for example. Another other group of challenges have to do with uh, social challenges, where a lot of times in dealing with scenarios, you're going beyond people's comfort levels, that we've got to be able to provide uh, opportunities for this creative discomfort uh, and expect it allow people to sort of think the unthinkable, to go beyond what their daily concerns are. And the other challenge is how to provide for effective engagement when some of the experts about a system or those who care a lot about a system may be placed at a wide distance, uh, not anywhere close enough to be doing a, an in-person workshop. And then there's some intellectual challenges as well, is how do you bring in a, such diverse information and a lot of different perspectives. And then we see that people have trouble, I think, distinguishing sometimes what are the external drivers of change from the internal responses, that is, their internal choices and their management choices that they may have. And then the last is actually providing that a traceable linkage between these external forces of change and the impacts of change. And that kind of gets back to that institutional need for being able to document how the, the group comes up with scenarios and uses scenarios as part of the management of public resources. Uh, scenario planning really came out of <clears throat> the business environment where they didn't have to worry so much about being able to show how they got to certain scenarios. It could be done at a high executive level and then simply um, change could be directed throughout the, the business from at the executive level. And it's not really the case for public resources. So let's look about actually building and refining the scenarios. There's a number of steps. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. I want to keep some things in mind is that it's, it, the goal of scenario planning is to help us become multi-temporal um, thinkers. So the past isn't really dead. We, we all can see legacies from the past that are affecting how we manage things today, whether it's the presence of the national forest system and other public lands, uh, say fire management, policies of the past, and so on. Um, the other aspect is the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. We can see other parts of the world that are experiencing conditions that we may experience in the future in our region. All right. And then in thinking about scenarios, we're not trying to just magnify our current challenges and just turn our newborn baby 20 years into the future into a much larger baby. Is it that the future evolves so that the character and the qualities of the, the future are what evolve, not just the current challenges uh, magnified. And I think Donald, I'll, I won't read this poem by Donald Rumsfeld, but I think he captures it pretty well in trying to distinguish that s what scenario planning um, focuses on, that is appreciating the things that we think we know with some certainty and then incorporating what we acknowledge that we don't know. If you hear people talking about, um, if you're in discussions about uh, resource management and planning and folks are saying, oh, we just don't know enough about that, then that is exactly the kind of topic that it's appropriate to use scenario planning to address. Yes. Right. So here's the steps. 
they're pretty, there's not too many, and sort of building the scenarios, it may look like a lot, but the reason I break it out into so many is, is because then it's easier to, it doesn't look so much like just magic that you get together and then scenarios come out. So the first two steps are to refine the scope of what you're, where you're focusing on, what time periods you're focusing on, and then what management issue you're focusing on, and then to start to identify key drivers external to your system that drive change. This is a particular activity. Um, there, there are specific engaging activities that are useful for going each through each of these steps. But in looking at your focus question, the idea is that you, it's okay to be tentative when you start, but you're looking at um, trying to, to figure out your question. A lot of times people start with saying, well, just what are the impacts? But what we're really looking at for is that intersection of what, what's knowable and unknowable and what's controllable and uncontrollable. So you would like a question, a focus question, to be something about how do we manage, not just say what are the impacts, but how will we manage something, or do our objectives need to change in the future? And then in looking at the external driver, what you're really looking at is to what would cause your system to shift, not just slightly, but to a vastly different character, or what would pose vastly different challenges. Right? It's really about stretching your thinking. There's no single method that's the best. There's a number of different approaches. Um, simplest ones are to ask other people to actually maybe have created scenarios that are appropriate for your region. The uh, regional integrated science and assessment pro projects around the country or the climate science centers may have done something like that. There may be some things out of the national climate assessment that are appropriate for you. You may want to use official futures but you'd have to question some of the assumptions behind those. Another whole set of activities is to look at, um, there are some engaging activities here in, in blue that allow you to work with different groups from a wide variety of experience uh, and levels of uh, uh, science sophistication. And then at the bottom, there's a, a set of um, approaches that are more structured that are really useful for going through this documentable uh, process. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I just want to make sure that I include this so that you can go look at this later about uh, specific activities that exist, like creating a, a, a history wall of past surprises in the region that help people understand that they've always been coping with external forces of change and surprise. And then there's other brainstorming activities that allow you to look at not just climate changes, but other kinds of change from social to technological, political, and so on, and other trends. Now, looking at these more structured approaches, um, the drivers, tables, and impacts have, are a nice way to structure information from this whole panoply of reports that just come out in an ongoing way, and a, and a structured table of drivers and impacts can be easily updated. These tables come from the University of Washington's Climate Impacts Group adaptation guidebook, and I just I want to put it out here. It's a great resource to start thinking about building your team, looking at climate change from uh, a local or regional perspective. These tables of, the, of drivers and impacts were taken up so quickly by the National Park Service and be have become an a, a, a key element of how they're doing their scenario planning. Um, and this, these tables come from a, a brand new guidebook that I'll talk about towards the end of my talk um, that you can see examples that they work through. So these are tables of drivers and, and impacts across different um, aspects of climate and resource values in public lands. Another approach is to look at influence diagrams. You can also think of these as schematic uh, models, schematic maps, conceptual maps of your system. There's a few things that you can look at. This is an example for a uh, uh, a region in southeast Arizona. But if you're looking, this is just a systems diagram, if you start seeing aspects like this where you've got the potential for feedbacks or cycles going on um, within your uh, system, this is a key place to look for how you, variables that might affect this, that might be external variables, that could really put your system into a whole different state that it's not just a change in the magnitude of uh, conditions, but a whole different character. Or you can look for key variables that are affected by a lot of um, upstream conditions 
and then have a lot of different impacts downstream. Sort of the, the, the keystone variables. And if changes happen there, they would have a lot of consequences. They would cascade, changes would cascade throughout the system. Those are key places to look at in these influence diagrams to identify forces of change that would really produce different scenarios or possibilities. Then you have to go through a process to look at all those external drivers and prioritize which ones really are the most critical to focus on and then how do you build those into scenarios. So there's a few different activities. Um, there's a, an, an impact versus uncertainty plot. There's some other approaches for going through and prioritizing these critical drivers. The key is that it's an iterative process, so it's nice to start off not just thinking you have to get the right answer right up front, but choose two to seven drivers and then just try some out. So you're looking at a fairly quick process for going through and creating different combinations of those drivers to build sort of a skeleton of a scenario to see whether the logic really is plausible, logically consistent internally, and that, that it really um, provides, that these scenarios really provide different kinds of challenges and, and opportunities and that really will stretch your thinking. Again, there's no right answer in which scenarios you build out. The goal is to really to produce different ones as a way to stretch your thinking. This is an example from the Crown of the Continent region in the Northern Rockies that uh, border the Northern uh, US and the Southern uh, Canadian boundary. This is an example of uh, different kinds of variables. And you can see in the tan, we, these were all climate variables. But then in blue and yellow, there were sort of internal variables and responses that people wanted to put into this impact and uncertainty plot. And you can see that what you're trying to do is sort of rate your different variables in terms of which ones have the highest uncertainty. So we're not actually looking for certainty. We're looking for which variables have the highest uncertainty, but also have the highest impact. And then these are the potential kind of bound bases for our, our scenarios. So what you, one approach is just this simple taking some of these uh, variables and using them as the axes for a quadrant. And so you take some different endpoints In this case, it was a rate of change of temperature increase for the crown of the continent region. And would climate change be expressed in, uh, gradually or abruptly with a rapid uh, change? And then non-winter precipitation is highly uncertain in that part of the country, so it could be greater or less. And then you can see that that produces four types of conditions that really are quite different from each other. There are some conditions that are sort of predetermined or those things that have high certainty or are legacies from uh, the past. And so you can see that ex increases in temperatures and uh, temperature extremes are assumed to go increase across all of the scenarios. The crossing of different environmental thresholds uh, is expected across all scenarios. Winter precipitation in this region was considered to be stable or increasing. Um, there would be earlier spring runoff the effect on the growing season and fire season, would they'd be extended, and there'd be phenological mismatches. That was common across all of the scenarios, but they really ended up being, because of these two um, axes, being quite different from each other. Now, there's a lot of different methods for creating those logics. I just showed the quadrant method. The, the Park Service has also used this notion of nested quadrants, and I'll show you in a second. But I do want to point out that there's a number of different kinds of approaches. They all are OK, but the goal is just to select three to five really different and challenging scenarios to build out in more detail. So this is what the, the nested scenarios look like from the Park Service uh, framework, where they've looked at, at a national level, some big issues that affect how um, the kind of the context we're looking at management options within a given region for public lands. And that is the level of societal concern and whether there's widespread indifference and competing concerns or whether there's heightened urgency and broad understanding by the public or those effective publics. And then there's the nature of leadership. That is, do you have good alignment and commitment and long-term perspectives at that national level to really allow local flexibility? And then whether you have sort of the opposite condition. A lot of different approaches focused on the short term with a lack of senior commitment, so a lot of constraints on what management might might do. So you can see that you have this broader set of axes with four big quadrants, and then you place your climate 
matrix or quadrants inside that. So you're just duplicating each of those four quadrants. That gives you 16 possible combinations. You don't need to build out all 16. You can focus on which ones, you can see highlighted in blue that this group chose, that really provide the biggest diversity of challenges, not in terms of worst case or best case, but in different kinds of challenges. In this case, they had a large uh, climate change, so big problems, but they also had a lot of societal concern for what's going on in the Northern Rockies and a lot of uh, <coughs> management flexibility. So they had big problems, big solutions. The, the question was, could they think big enough to deal with this problem? On the other hand, we had something like um, this climate complacency where the climate was changing gradually and maybe not so much over time, but you're constrained by people being focused elsewhere, so not concerned with the Northern Rockies, and then policy flexibility being limited and so on. So we had a range. So you're looking to build out three or five of these that will really stretch your thinking. Now, one of the question, one of the things that came out of this experiment for the Northern Rockies, we showed that this approach works across a lot of different organizations. We were working with 23 different organizations across the countries and with tribes and so on. But this goes down to from the national scale to the regional scale. And there were some issues about how do you get it down to that local scale to the where the on-the-ground manager, the field manager, can relate to the scenarios. So we've been working in southeast Arizona with the Bureau of Land Management and Nature Conservancy and some others, the Sienegas Watershed Partnership, to do this at a very local scale. And you can see that um, we've broken the group up into focusing on four different kinds of uh, management topics that are, that are more focused, that is upland resources, riparian resources, high elevation montane resources, and then cultural and historical resources. And each of those groups are developing their own scenarios, but they're starting off with re regional climate scenarios that were developed by the climate team out of the climate assessment for the Southwest. The, the CLEMAS team went through this same scenario creation process. The, this is their, in, their impacts and uncertainty uh, diagrams, and then these are the axes that they came up with um, that show different kinds of potential climates for the Southwest and what was common across all of the quadrants. Uh, and then you can see here what are the key uncertainties. That is winter precipitation, the character of spring and summer winds, um, the start of the monsoon season, whether it will be early or late, and then this occurrence of uh, tropical cyclones like autumn um, tropical storms coming up from the uh, Pacific into the southwest. So the management group in southeast Arizona took these regional climate scenarios then, created their own scenarios that looked at local influences, some of which may be happening at the national scale. Um, they're, they're not climate related. So they, for example, the Upland group came out with looking at government funding about whether they have consistent but low funding or boom and bust funding, that is just very cyclic um, opportunities. And then they're very much affected by the nature of uh, environmental laws. And they took their scenarios and then nested it within these larger climate scenarios. So you can see it's a different way of doing the nesting. Not from the, you can go from the national policy matrix to the regional climate. And in this case, you go from the regional climate to the local policy issues or other kinds of driving forces. The Montaigne group, that high elevation um, forest systems, they ended up looking at things like uh, uh, bugs and pests and disease, for example, as some of their key drivers. Right? So once you've chosen your drivers, then the question is, is what do you do with that? If, if you can use those scenarios at that level, just from that alone, there's real insights that can be developed. But it's helpful to spend some time with those scenarios, build them out, think about how they evolve over time. You don't get from now to the end of the century, just all of, all of a sudden, that the future plays out, and it, it, it helps to kind of think about how that, that future evolves over time. And then it's really power to, powerful to develop stories or other ways of communicating what's in those scenarios. So this is an example from the uh, Uplands group where they were nesting their 
one of their scenarios here where they had low funding uh, but current laws inside of a very a, a, a dry, windy regional climate scenario. And you can see how their, their challenges changed over time. They looked at 2020, 2050, and 2100 and kind of tried to capture just in a, a real briefly what were some of their uh, issues and risks. And then we're able to encapsulate that for this uh, set of nested scenarios, what is their, their challenge? How, is to, how are you going to transition the vegetation types with minimal soil exposure, no matter what the species is, um, while you're meeting Endangered Species Act obligations? Under this particular scenario, that, that's kind of their key challenge. How would they respond to that? Uh, another one, they were looking at low funding um, in a boom and bust cycle, and this combination of an early monsoon with decreased uh, high intensity events in the fall. Things look favorable in terms of precipitation, but yet they've got um, environmental laws and other kinds of laws being um, reduced over time so that you can see things that development <coughs> pressures dominate and interact with some of invasive species or other kinds of uh, climate conditions, and that even in what might be considered a favorable future, they still have some challenges. For example, how to ensure the expanse of the native vegetation under development pressures, even under what you might see as a productive climate. So you can see that this is the third one. I'm not going to go into the details of it. You can look at it on your own um, since we're recording the webinar. But you can see that for each of these kinds of scenarios, you can build it out over time and think about how you um, might respond under each of these time periods. What this does is it allows you to look at possible futures that are increasingly um, challenging, but without having to go to an all or nothing kind of future. Right? So then you develop out the narratives. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. I do want to point out that there are very some specific activities that you can use. There's things about trying to develop newspaper headlines or just collecting images. The goal is to try to tell a compelling story, to think about the time evolution, to think about who, is, who are the actors, uh, how might they have to respond? Is it a challenge response? Is it sort of a changing, uh, um, changing generations, for example, that is uh, people that have different values and so on over time? And in the creating the scenario narrative, it's great to try to connect to the values and the focus of the people uh, who are doing the management or um, living in that region. Right? The key is to, de to define the, the challenge, but not the response. At this point, you're just developing the narrative that managers would then respond to. Okay. Images are a great way for telling a story. I can show this picture uh, to a lot of different kinds of folks, and they get this notion very quickly that the challenges facing managers under climate uncertainty are really um, daunting. Right. You can evaluate your scenarios. This goes back to the crown of the continent example, where we actually asked people to evaluate the scenarios on some different criteria. And generally, even extreme, what might be considered extreme scenarios can rate fairly well. This one where we had big problems and big solutions, um, it got the lowest rating, not because of anything done related to the climate, but it had to do with people's skepticism about the availability of resources to deal with the problem. So it's, it's, it's good to evaluate your uh, scenarios. You're really, again, just trying to make them relevant and challenging. They need to be plausible. Um, they need to be internally consistent. So then the question is, is so what? You've got your uh, scenarios developed. They pose a wide range of challenges. Now what? Right? So that gets into sort of using the scenarios to try to create, evaluate, prioritize, and then implement different management options. You know, once the scenarios are developed, one of the key things that comes out of the process, even just right out of the gate, is the insight that they bring and then the use of those narratives to do outreach to help people think about different ways that the future could evolve. You can bring that kind of insight into any ongoing process, any kind of stakeholder discussions that you've already got going on, modeling studies. You can look at to see whether existing models can take in those kinds of different inputs or is it that the models are constrained by the uh, range of observations that were used to design that model in the first place? Uh, you can do the vulnerability assessments uh, of each of the scenarios. You can look at 
specific agency planning processes like the Park Service uh, resource stewardship um, studies, the Bureau of Land Management's rapid ecological assessments, the Forest Service um, integrated land uh, project, and then different kinds of business development planning that neighbors to public lands might be, um, be using. The second thing that you can do with the scenario narratives is to look at existing plans. There's been a lot of effort so far already to look at different kinds of options, adaptation options for dealing with climate change and other kinds of change. Do those actions hold up under all the scenarios that you've created as part of this scenario planning process? What actions have already been innovated or, or suggested? It, this is a, the, these scenarios provide a good way to kind of test whether those options really are as robust as you might think, or whether they could lead you to sort of a trap and inflexibility in, in the future. And then the last, as you can see in the gray at the bottom here, is to innovate new adaptation options. And it's not just saying new things what we should do, but then are there things that we're currently doing that we should stop doing? And then are there things that we could, may not want to implement permanently, but then that can you serve as a transition from where we are now to where we might want to be in the future, but we do these things um, just as, as, as a bridge. An example of that would be the California Condor uh, program where you're releasing them out to the wild. You'd like to see the systems develop so that they can uh, reproduce in the wild just fine, but the, the, the breeding program, the breeding and release program is a bridge to the restoration of uh, systems that are uh, sufficient for their natural reproduction. Right. And then lastly is um, to look at a por whole portfolio of options. And in thinking about this portfolio, I want to take a couple of minutes. Um, well, these are just kind of the different steps. I'm not going to go into detail in each of these steps, but th this kind of lays out the variety of things that you can do with your scenarios. Um, I just want to lay out the different kind of adaptation options that you might think of in creating your portfolio. It's not enough just to look at, say, these first two, which a lot of processes look at, and that is sort of how to defend against change. An example of that would be, um, say, building a dam to store water so that it buffers the change, that downstream of the dam you don't even notice that there was uh, variability in the stream flow. Or, or something like resilience, that in, de in dealing, say, with forest health, you're trying to uh, bounce back after a fire or some disturbance so that you maintain your system qualities. But there are other kinds of adaptation options or other categories that it's good to have some in your portfolio as well. And that is to um, what are some actions that could facilitate change and movement of parts of the system from one place to another. And I think you're all familiar, you see some uh, examples of these or suggestions for these coming out. Uh, in terms of looking for regional approaches, looking for interconnections, whether it's uh, large-scale uh, migration corridors, increasing the diversity of your seed pool, for example. And then there are some others that are maybe a little more difficult and that I don't often see addressed except out of some scenario planning activities, and that is dealing with realignment, thinking about different systems, a whole different function of your, you're, you're trying to focus on the function of your system, but it may look quite a bit different. So the example here is looking at a car, if you're just thinking about it as transportation, uh, it might look uh, different, but it'll get you from one place to the other. Um, this one on re reduction and mitigation of greenhouse gases in order to just reduce the, the um, intensity of your challenge. Uh, there's a lot of other processes that deal with that. And then the last one is looking at something like triage. It's being uh, pragmatic about how do you cut your losses. Uh, scenario planning can provide a good avenue for thinking about those choices. They're not necessarily pleasant, but it's worth thinking about that and having some things in your portfolio um, that might address that kind of approach. Right? So in looking at your scenario narratives and thinking about your different actions, um, there's some different activities that are really helpful, and that is, I'll just throw out one here, is that it's helpful to work backwards in time. You work with a single scenario, one at a time, and then think about, put yourself in the place of a manager, not in the present, but think about somebody who's 
just a young kid today and is it there at the end of their career, they've been retired for a couple of decades, where do they wish their legacy would have been um, sort of from their career? You think about the kind of the defining laws now, uh, we're looking at the, where the public land boundaries are, the existence of the public lands, the NEPA process, the Endangered Species Act, and so on. Those are strong legacies that are now um, decades, decades old. And the other way to work backwards in time is to look at uh, a manager who's sort of at the end of their career in 2050, and what do they wish they would have done or known at the start of their mm -hmm. career, say 30 years or so. Mm -hmm. So by looking at these different time periods then, you can start to um, innovate your actions. It's helpful to create a timeline for each of those actions and then identify different triggers from when those actions might be implemented. Right. Um, it's useful to think about if you can't meet some of your objectives that, you're, um, that are highly specific now, that you can go to more fundamental objectives. The Bureau of Land Management in Southeast Arizona is um, using this kind of approach to look at flexible objectives, for, especially for dealing with realignment and the, the, the triage issue. Um, it, this leads us to different concepts of what does it mean to have a no regret strategy. Right? We're really looking beyond just increasing the resilience of a system or beyond locking in vulnerabilities. Um, where we're really headed is trying to include all those options, that is, from resistance to uh, realignment to uh, triage um, to have some options in our, our portfolio and then think about how we weight the investment in each of those activities so that we're prepared for anything that could happen. Um, I'm just going to leave it with this. Is, this is an example from the Crown of the Continent um, scenario planning activity where you can kind of see then these different kind of options that have been um, suggested. We ended up out of a a, 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 the workshop for this region with nearly 400 different adaptation options proposed. I've pulled out just a few here. You can see that some options uh, fit all of the scenarios, some options fit just a few, a couple of the scenarios, and then some options are very contingent or unique to a very specific future and maybe things that you don't want to do. They're in the area of uh, realignment, that is changing some of your priorities, for example, allowing dams in the park or in letting some systems go to, to, to transition without, um, without management to try to, to, try to sustain them. Um, then you can start to identify some of the decision points. So the, sort of how you evaluate these options is kind of a whole other presentation. And I'd be happy to talk with anybody about that, but that's probably more detail than we have time for now. So I want to just wrap up by, by saying that um, you know, scenario planning is a very specific process. There's a lot of different tools for going through that process. Some of them, it, a lot of them are highly engaging with people who uh, are not associated with public lands management, that is with outside partners, outside organizations, uh, stakeholders um, in communities near, near the public lands. Um, it can integrate with existing planning processes by providing a number of possible futures to evaluate with existing uh, planning, planning standards and criteria. Uh, I'll point out this new guidebook that was just issued in July from the National Park Service. It's a great handbook uh, that comes out of uh, the Climate Change Response Program uh, from Lee Welling, Matt Rose, Don Weeks, and Kat uh, Hawkins Hoffman that um, are really great for providing some sort of very specific steps and activities. And then I'll point out a, a guidebook to look for that's going to be put out this fall, which is being funded by the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Wildlife Conservation uh, Society is putting that together. And they've um, designed some training that there was a pilot training on scenario planning that happened at the uh, National Conservation Training Center in West Virginia this summer. They're going to be doing more of that. Um, so in the same way that they do training for structured decision making. So I just alert you to those things to um, look for in thinking about uh, doing your own scenario planning process. And with that, I think we've got some time for questions. Great. Thank you so much, Holly, and thank you, Greg. And we will open it up to questions. Please remember to unmute your phone to ask your question.
I, I have a question. This is Amy Robertson. Um, I'll start things off here while other people think about what they want to ask. So Holly, I talk to a lot of uh, natural resource managers and many of them are wondering, you know, um, going through this planning process is, um, it, you know, it, it costs money, it's, um, it takes time, and they're wondering, <laughs> But what is the value of doing that when I could take that money and put it into a project on the ground? So right. I would, if you could describe sort of the relative benefits um, of doing that and, and how you might answer that question. Right. And I would say, you know, that, that you could certainly take money and put it on the ground today, but then the question is, is that action something that will pay off in the long run? Um, does it really lead you to have resilience or provide a response or realignment that you might need going forward. Um, the scenario planning allows you to evaluate what you might do on the ground and really prioritize which things will really be that lead to increased flexibility or increased nimbleness in being able to manage a wide variety of things that could happen over the coming decades. So it's to use your money wisely. The scenario planning process doesn't have to be really expensive. You can do things fairly, fairly inexpensively. It's, um, if you use scenarios that have been developed by others or look at results from reports elsewhere, and the whole notion of scenario planning is to be able to do it quickly and efficiently so you can look at new uncertainties as they evolve as well. You don't have to just look at it once every decade. Um, does that help? Yes, it does. Thank you, okay. Holly. Um, does anyone else have a question? If so, please unmute your phone. Um, tell us who you are and, and your question. Yeah, Wayne Robbie here. Um, Holly, I was just wondering if the publications you were referring to at the end of the slideshow are online and if you could send us a link to that. Um, yeah, I can. Let me uh, bring that up here real quick. Whoops. Good. There we go. The uh, yeah, the the, the guidebook. Um, this is out. This one is not yet out. It's been in review. I think it just went back this week for the final uh, review. And then okay. um, there, the material from this training course, I believe, is available as well. And this is Amy again. I will certainly look for those links. And when we have the recorded webinar uh, ready to post and send out, we'll include links to those articles as well. Or to those awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Does anyone else have a question for Holly or Greg? Yes, this is Dwayne Poole. Holly, this is really, really good. I, I really like the, the start where you made it fairly clear through the, the normal curve and actually shifting the normal curve that you're not necessarily dealing with a 1 in 40 event. A, a 1 in 6 event makes more sense. Okay. Given the, the nature of the material that you're presenting here and thinking about other audiences. Are there specific elements out of what you've presented here that you think resonate really well with those who are the policy value-based decision makers? Yeah, you know, the, the process itself about a structured way of thinking about uncertainties wherever they come from, about thinking about these external forces of change wherever they come from, um, you know, the, the, it seems like the, the high-level managers have no trouble uh, sort of latching on to scenario planning because they're struggling with uncertainties and these external drivers of change all the time, uh, whether it's changes in budgets, whether it's changes in policies. Uh, so having that structured process is really helpful. And then when it comes to uh, this climate change as, a, as, as kind of a focus for the scenario planning, there are so many other things. You cannot imagine a future where the climate is changing but nothing else is changing. <laughs> so being able to integrate those other forces of change with the climate uh, possibilities, that it really helps people sort of, they naturally, come, naturally understand the interconnections between things and being able to talk about those other forces of change um, allows anybody, not just scientists, right, to, to participate. And um, yeah, so it, and, it, and it takes a lot of the pressure off of the climate models because there is no way a budget future is more certain than a climate future. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
That's, yeah. that's a great point, Holly. <laughs> I think we might have time for maybe one more question. Yeah, Holly, uh, this is Mark Briggs. Um, I was curious, you get a group of people together who are maybe vaguely familiar, if not at all, with scenario planning. What what time commitment are you talking about to take them through a process where at the end of the day, you know, they have um, some good information on which to act on? Right. It, it depends on how you design your process, and it really depends on kind of the resources that you've got available. I've been involved with projects, for example, in this Sienegas one where we have a core team and with a project that's maybe um, $35,000, $40,000 over a six-month period where we're just the, the core team is getting some of the data together, but then we really focus on engaging with the managers at um, a one-day workshop with some follow-on from kind of the uh, a core team for each of those resource areas. Uh, I'm involved in a project up in uh, central Arizona with county planners and city planners and some of the uh, timber and mining interests and, and uh, NGOs and agencies. We're doing it, in that case, it's to foster discussion. It's not to come up with actual plans, but it's to foster mm -hmm. discussion. And they're going through this whole process of creating, looking at uncertainty, and then looking at possible actions in a series of four one-day workshops where, where we've got a different theme for each workshop. So, for mm. example, forest is one of the themes, and they're going all the way through the process in a single day. Those are kind of the lowest end <laughs> efforts, right? It's maybe not desirable, but it's what's practical under certain circumstances, and good things are happening from mm. those efforts, right? Um, on the other hand, your preference would be to have a dedicated team who addresses something maybe in once a month meetings um, and really puts a lot more a lot more into creating the scenarios and then evaluating the options mm -hmm. but that I think maybe starting from the low end gives you some idea of what's possible thank you great thank you so much Holly and on behalf of the desert landscape conservation cooperative I want to thank you for the presentation today and and to Greg for, for the wonderful introduction. And uh, thanks to everyone who made time to be on the webinar today. I think this information is of great interest to a large number of people. We maxed out our conference line and had to add new lines. And um, we've had a lot of folks inquiring about whether it would be recorded. So we will be making this available for future viewing. All right. So thank and you all very, very much. Yeah, and thank don't you. hesitate to contact me if you've got any other questions. Thank you, Holly. Thanks, Greg. Okay. Bye. Thanks.